Hi everyone, I'm Maurice Samuels, the director of the Yale Program for the Study of Antisemitism, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's Benjamin and Barbara Zucker lecture, part of our ongoing lecture series this semester exploring the relationship of antisemitism to other forms of racism and prejudice. So when I started to think about organizing this lecture series this summer, uh, I asked colleagues for suggestions of speakers and uh, I was, the, the first name that people suggested to me was Cheryl Greenbergs. And I was thrilled that she accepted our invitation to speak. Uh, she's the Paul E. Rather Distinguished Professor of History at Trinity College, where she teaches and writes on African-American history, race relations, and 20th century civil rights and social justice movements. She's written and edited a number of books and articles, but most relevant for today's discussion is Troubling the Waters, Black Jewish Relations in the American Century, published by Princeton University Press in 2010. She's currently editing a memoir of a civil rights worker and the Mississippi town he worked in, which should be out next year, and also working on a project about uh, the history of African American and Jewish American defense agencies debates and shifting answers about how to balance preventing hate speech and protecting free speech. So the plan for today is that Professor Greenberg is going to speak for about 30 minutes and show us some slides, and then we'll open it up for discussion. But audience members are muted uh, because this is a webinar. So what I ask you to do is please submit your questions to me using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, not the chat function. But the Q&A function, please send me your questions as soon as you think of them, even during the talk, and then I will uh, ask them to Professor Greenberg. Uh, now, please join me in welcoming Cheryl Greenberg. Cheryl, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, uh, first of all, I just want to say how honored I am to be part of such a terrific series. Um, and I especially want to give Jeff Melnick a shout out. He's, uh, he helped me come up with my book title. Uh, and in some ways, I want to, I'm going to be building on the very interesting uh, discussion between him and Anthony Russell. And I want to emphasize two points that they made. Uh, first, that it is both difficult and dangerous to compare African Americans and Jewish Americans when the two communities are largely so separated by class and living under very different circumstances. Uh, the second thing I wanna stress is that we often forget that many Jews are both black and Jewish. So here when I say, or most people who talk about this say Jews, uh, I'm really referring to white, especially Eastern European Jews. This overlooking of racial dynamics in the American Jewish community is, in fact, one reason that I see for the failures of Jews in the Black Jewish relationship. That is, that Jewish whites uh, ran all of the powerful organizations I'm going to be discussing and never considered or consulted their own community's members of color. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. Uh, before 2016, I gave these sorts of talks in a context of a resurgent, optimistic, liberal energy. And within that, an enthusiasm of both African-American and Jewish groups to see if we could once more join forces to advance the causes that both communities endorse. The question I was asking then was, how do we harness this energy to move forward? How quaint. Now, we are in what feels like an entirely new moment of threat and danger, although one with historically familiar and frightening overtones. Even if we're not, as many of us fear, on the verge of fascism, we are certainly at a moment where the values that most of us cherish, egalitarianism, justice, democracy, are under threat. Some of you may disagree, and I'm happy to make my case in the question and answer period, but let's agree for the moment at least that that sense of optimism among both liberals and progressives has turned into a grim determination to fight against our moving backward. So what do we do? As a historian, I say, look to the past. If we wanna rebuild effective coalitions to protect and promote those agendas that we value, we can do no better 
than to look at the history of coalitions between, the Af between African Americans and Jewish Americans. Not because that coalition was smooth, but precisely because it wasn't. But it was still incredibly effective. So their successes can teach us all a great deal about effective strategies and possibilities, and their failures can instruct us about potential pitfalls. In fact, as I'll talk about, some of this rebuilding and some of this sniping and infighting is already happening. So today I'm gonna to violate every rule of the historical profession and use the past in the service of the present. I wanna plumb the history of black Jewish relations for lessons to be learned. I'm also gonna violate every rule of public speaking and give the conclusions right up front. First, that the black Jewish coalition and the broader liberal and progressive coalition won victories in so many areas of civil rights, civil liberties, liberties and ec economic justice while fighting internally. That is in the words of civil rights activist, Bernice Johnson Reagan, we learned that, quote, you can get things done even when you're in a mess, unquote. Blacks and Jews, in other words, looked up from their immediate differences and by keeping their broader goals in mind, move forward together. And second, that this coalition was weakened, not just by class and racial differences, which I will talk about, but also by divergent political understandings of those class and racial different that, that those class and racial differences led to, most particularly about the liberal goal of race blindness and the invisibility of white privilege to Jews who did not see themselves as entirely white. The fact is that a tie between the black and Jewish communities uh, bond has long been expressed and not just among leaders as some have argued. Consider Obama Jewish outreach or Jews for Obama. There are no Swedes for Obama or Obama Methodist outreach. Nor is this feeling just among Jews as other people have claimed. The NAACP protests swastikas and anti-Semitic incidents. Black churches support Israel and they rallied in Pittsburgh after the synagogue shooting. And as I recently learned, Martin Luther King's birthday is also National Bagel Day. Who knew? I'm not claiming, although I wish I could, that there's something inherent in our two people, something natural about any affinity between blacks and Jews. There's nothing special about Jewish ethics that makes Jews more likely than Christians to care about black equality. There were no Jews in the leadership ranks of the abolitionist movement. In fact, one Southern rabbi who spoke against slavery was run out of town by his own congregation. Reform and secular Jews far outnumbered the Orthodox in civil rights work. Nor is there anything special about our both being oppressed minority groups. So are the Irish, so are the Japanese. They generally did not make common cause with other outgroups. In fact, more often they tried to embrace whiteness so as to be integrated into the mainstream more quickly. But what I am claiming is that something happened to make African-Americans and white Jews, because after all, black Jews were already there, move toward each other in, a, in the way that they did. Which is actually, if you think about it, a heartening notion that communities like individuals have real choices that they can make, that there's no such thing as political predestination. Well, if it's not natural, but it came about from some set of historical conditions or events, then better understanding those conditions can perhaps serve as a model for us moving forward. So if I'm right, what helped create that political bond and why did it come apart? What worked and what should, be, what should we be careful not to do again? And that is a job for a historian. So I'm gonna do a quick his, skip through history of black Jewish relations in the US, the good, the bad, and as promised, the lessons to learn. African-Americans and Jewish Americans have had very different histories, but they had some common experiences around the turn of the 20th century. They, had, they both migrated into urban areas, over 2 million Jews from Eastern Europe and Russia, and over a million African-Americans moved south to north in a, in a move so massive that they call it the Great Migration. They had common experiences of discrimination and exclusion from jobs, neighborhoods, schools, and housing. And there was hatred and violence, while racism was, of course, much more virulent in the United States than anti-Semitism, both had been known to erupt into lethal violence. 
So in response, and like other groups, African Americans and Jewish Americans banded together to form organizations to help them. In the African American community, for example, there's the National Association of Colored Women in 1896, the NAACP in 1909, the National Urban League, the National Council of Negro Women, and among the Jew their Jewish counterparts were the National Council of Jewish Women in 1893. And by the way, in both communities, notice women led the way, which is a fact true through the entire civil rights movement, but that's a story for another time. Anyway, the American Jewish Committee in 1906, the ADL in 1913, the American Jewish Congress, and the Jewish Labor Committee. But while both these groups had the same goal, which was equal opportunity and full inclusion in American life, virtually no white organization was willing to work with black groups in order to achieve it. That was not true of the left, who did, but that's also a story for another time. Certainly individual Jews and blacks work together. Of the NAACP's founders, for example, a disproportionate number of white, uh, of white founders were Jewish. Black and Jewish intellectuals in the early 20th century, uh, including Horace Callan, Alan Locke, and Franz Boas, challenged the assimilationist rhetoric of what was called 100% Americanism, which I think is code for only WASP culture can make American great again, make America great again. But their idea was called pluralism, that all groups have different cultures and traditions that we should celebrate. They're not a threat because underneath we all share basic values. We're all distinct, but we're not separatist. We are part of what makes the United States special. But Jews, like other whites, hesitated to get involved with African-Americans on a broader level. As an Anti-Defamation League leader reasoned, the difficulties facing the Jews as a minority group are sad enough without tying ourselves up with another minority group of less influence, and by so doing, probably taking on some of their troubles a group whose difficulties in my estimation are even more deplorable than our own. As I said, that was true for most white and other minority groups. They continued to stand apart, but Jews moved. Why is that? Really it changed in the 1930s with the rise of Nazism and fascism here and in Europe. Jews reached out to African-Americans for help leading uh, combining to do to work in things like holding anti-racism rallies. Here there's Du Bois and, um, and Stephen Wise speaking at an anti-racism uh, rally in New York. And African-Americans took the opportunity to link Nazi racism to racism here at home, like in the double V campaign, victory abroad and victory at home, or in this NAACP telegram that they sent to the State Department on Kristallnacht. American Negroes share the indignation at the outrages of the Nazi government. But we would be even more enthusiastic if our government could be equally indignant at the lynching of American citizens by American mobs on American soil, which have shamed America for a much longer time. Clearly, this was based on self-interest on both sides. So for those keeping score, lesson one, for those looking to build coalitions, start with self-interest. That self-interest broadened over the next two decades into an act of collaboration on a wide range of civil rights issue. And again, the question is why? And really it's for the same reason that crimes are successful, time and opportunity. The moment was right. For Jews who didn't wanna call attention to anti-Semitism for fear that that would give it a wider platform, they pushed for broad anti-discrimination legislation. And Nazism, in fact, the whole of Jewish history, taught them that if today's target was African, were African-Americans, then the Jews always came next. For African-American leaders, Jews seemed a powerful and well-organized ally, one they could persuasively appeal to, particularly given the Nazi threat. To make collaboration work, both Black and Jewish leaders emphasized the common plight of Blacks and Jews, their shared suffering. This is a pamphlet obviously from the ADL, that basically argues the Klan hates African-Americans today, but don't you worry, they're gonna come after the Jews tomorrow. Another ADL 
uh, spokesperson said, we know, we Jews know what restrictions mean. We too have faced handicaps. Because of this, Jews show such deep interest in the Negroes' problems. The Yiddish press had long covered lynch mobs and, call, and called them pogroms. And the deteriorating situation of German Jews received, received extensive coverage in black newspapers. So what launched the black Jewish collaboration by the late 1930s wasn't a broadening of the challenge to discrimination, but the decision to work against it together. Still, that was a pivotal shift. It meant that both communities had redefined their self-interest as including the concerns of others, what I call a spacious sense of self-interest. Lesson two making common cause. But spatial, space, spacious self-interest isn't just understanding that lynching and pogroms are, both constitute a similar kind of oppression. It's recognizing the link between those issues, rearticulating one's own agenda in a more universalist way. This wasn't about blacks or Jews alone, but all Americans. Only by attacking all forms of bigotry could any group be safe. And so leaders in both communities emphasized that all civil rights issues were interconnected. And so self-interest lay in a broad-based attack on inequalities and that we were all fighting the same fight. And this brings us to lesson three. Articulate that broader spacious self-interest as a universalist vision of national moral concern. As uh, Martin Luther King put it about the civil rights movement, if we are wrong, the Supreme Court of this nation is wrong. If we are wrong, the Constitution of the United States is wrong. If we are wrong, God Almighty is wrong. And it worked. In 1938, a Black Baptist church raised funds for Jewish ref refugees, sending with its money this note. As a race of people whose souls have been made sensitive through many years of persecution and suffering, we extend our profoundest sympathies to the Jewish people in their present plight. And there was a wartime Detroit study that showed that not only did black people ex expect more of Jewish people, given their shared sense of, uh, of victimization, but Jews themselves felt that way, that Jews should be expected to do better than other white people. For this to be meaningful, you have lesson four, that you must educate your own community about this expansive social vision. So for example, in New York City, there were many complaints about white exploitation of black domestics. Black women would stand on street corners, white women would come and pick them up and often take advantage of them, not pay them, whatever. Um, but only Jews respond to the problem. And what they do is they set up an employment agency where African-American women can come and white women can come and hire them. But notice who's doing the hiring. In other words, emphasizing black Jewish similarity in suffering masked crucial racial and class differences between the two communities, which would later help erode the, co the coalition. And a small aside here, in case I haven't provoked enough of you yet, all this occurred over the protests of many Southern Jews who had both absorbed local racial views and feared speaking up that would provoke anti-Semitism. And actually they were right. They not only kept quiet, but they begged their Northern Jewish counterparts to be quiet or at least stay out of their communities. But that's also another story. But I'm large, so I'm largely speaking here, not only about white Jews, but about Northern white Jews who saw united action in civil rights in the Jewish self-interest in that more spacious sense. These political changes in the black and Jewish communities were affected also by changing US politics. There was a new public rhetoric that emerged first in wartime because the war demanded unity. News and genocidal violence of genocidal violence in Europe made the United States made the United States emphasize the importance of tolerance and pluralism, at least rhetorically. And the emergent Cold War reminded us that overt discrimination and segregation in the United States was the best propaganda that the USSR had to win non-white, non-aligned nations to their side. So the result was a newly shaped political liberalism that understood rights 
as rooted individ in individuals, not groups. They advocated, it advocated access to employment, to housing, to voting, civic life, all protected from di discrimination based on one's group membership. It was moderate because it was anti-communist, but this moderate moderation was okay because it was pluralist. Since we're all the same under the skin, all we have to do is change our hearts and all else will follow. And the coalition building between black and Jewish organizations was spurred and shaped by this new li liberalism. And you see it in every joint black and Jewish venture on behalf of integration. In the 1940s and 1950s, among local and national groups, among leadership and grassroots, where, the seg where segregation was the law, they challenged it. Where it violated the law, they took discriminators to court. They proposed civil rights planks for democratic and Republican platforms. Yes, Republican platforms. They testified before congressional committees on civil rights, civil liberties, and social welfare legislation. They co-sponsored letter writing campaigns and petitions. They co-sponsored lobbying efforts. They conferred on legislative and legal strategies. And they focused on civic education. Because liberal, li liberalism focuses on treating people as individuals, not members of groups, it implied that uh, that discrimination operated on the basis of individual attitudes and behaviors. So Black and Jewish agencies produced educational materials for schools, churches, and civic groups that stress pluralism and tolerance, based on the assumption, again, that more united groups than divided them, that changing people's beliefs and behaviors was the key to achieving true equality. In other words, discrimination was explained not by white people protecting their advantage, but by personal bigotry. Once again, though, notice who is the boss and who is the employee. And their spacious sense, sorry, and their spacious universalist articulation of liberal values meant that these collaborative efforts went far beyond direct self-interest. Segregation laws, for example, did not affect Jews but all the major Jewish organizations filed briefs for the Brown decision and dozens of earlier and lesser known civil rights cases. And the NAACP fought for higher immigra immigration quotas for Jewish refugees. And they lobbied the Haitian, Liberian and Filipino UN delegations to support the creation of Israel. And these successes were notable. Black and Jewish agencies and their allies desegregated hospitals, schools, housing projects, unions, bowling leagues, restaurants, beaches, medical and legal associations. Local coalitions passed anti-discrimination and anti-KKK legislation, and by the way, also anti-mask legislation, interesting today, uh, in dozens of cities. They integrated workplaces, they challenged the poll tax, they fought segregated housing. In Hollywood, a black and Jewish group challenged racial and ethnic stereotyping in movies. And in New York, it was a joint black and Jewish effort that created SUNY, the state university system in order to compensate for racial and religious discrimination at private colleges. They opened social and economic opportunities, expanded anti-discrimination protections, extended educational and legal equality and expanded the social services safety net. But while all of this was happening, there were also powerful tensions between the two communities because most blacks and Jews remained divided by race, religion, and class, which had real but unrecognized impacts on people's attitudes. And that was because of liberalism's limits, which, large, which largely ignored race and class implications, especially because talking about those issues sounded suspiciously like communism. And by focusing on individuals, they missed structural problems, institutional racism that went beyond personal bias. In other words, theoretical liberal race, bi race blindness was not enough. That's because racial discrimination and its consequences had trapped African-Americans North and South into low wage, low mobility employment. And that was a structural problem. Eastern European Jews had also begun life here at the bottom, but though similarly poor, they had come from urban areas and often had skills unavailable to most black rural agricultural workers. And these two factors, plus good timing and white skin, helped them rise economically despite anti-Semitism. But most Jews 
who were committed to this individualist liberal ethic didn't recognize the role that structural racism played in limiting black progress. And so we come to lesson five. You can't find effective solutions if you ignore the structures of discrimination. So here are Jews who are primarily white and economically more successful, which of course are related, working in African-American neighborhoods because they also are a bit less racist. Jews see themselves as open and tolerant, rising on hard work. They don't see themselves as white. They were persecuted by white people in Europe. But African-Americans do, Jew, do see Jews as white. They had economic benefits because they were white, even though Jews may not have seen it. So because Jews were in black neighborhoods, black people saw them not as social outsiders, but as insiders exploiting black outsiders and they protest. Jews see these protests as anti-Semitism, while black people see it as rich white people soaking, black, uh, soaking poor black people. And at the same time, historic Christian anti-Semitism sometimes turned black class resentment into anti-Semitic expressions. As James Baldwin famously wrote, Negroes are anti-Semitic because they're anti-white. To be explicit then, even as they made common cause politically, Black and Jewish collaboration weakened because racial and class differences still divided most Blacks and Jews. But by and large, that fact went unacknowledged and unaddressed. Lesson six, positionality matters. People view the same situations differently depending on where they stand, their priorities, their values, or their access to power. Despite these tensions and despite Jews increasing economic status, Jewish groups continued to support civil rights efforts with their black colleagues. Well, they did this so well into the 60s, including demonstrations, marches and lobbying, and the hardest and most dangerous organizing work. This of course is Goodman, Schwerner and Cheney uh, who disappeared at the beginning of Mississippi Freedom Summer and were found uh, under a dam. And the two heads of the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights were Roy Wilkins of the NAACP and Arnold Aronson who, from the National Jewish Community Relations Advisory Council. But the Jewish, sorry, but the liberal consensus was fraying around them. By the mid 1960s to many, especially young people, liberalism seemed to have failed the movement. There was no federal protection for those engaged in legal activities like registering to vote. The attacks on, on civil rights folks went unpunished. And at the Democratic National Convention in 1964, that allegedly liberal party refused to sit the, black, sit the integrated black Mississippi delegation to replace the one elected by an illegal all white primary. And King was attacked in Chicago, one of the bastions of, nor of Northern liberalism. All this provokes black nationalism, militants and black power. SNCC and Co Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and CORE became all, all black. You see the rise of the Black Panther Party. Their argument was you can't trust white liberals because when they're forced to choose, they act not as liberals, but as white people. They also criticized liberalism uh, for its commitment to integration. It was unachievable, but it was also cultural genocide. And their alliance with other groups of color and anti-colonial movements moved many black people to repeatedly criticize Israel for its treatment of Palestinians. And this hurt Jewish, the Jewish community despite reassurances from established black leaders. Meanwhile, Jews were rethinking their own commitments. This was not about Israel, not just about Israel, I should say. They saw black nationalism and separatism as a wound in the heart, that they saw radicalism as a tactical error that it will alienate moderates who are still needed to pass civil, civil rights legislation. And as civil, the civil rights movement moved north into the neighborhoods of these liberal Jews, the question of integration took on a different meaning. And I should just point out that these FHA um, real estate maps where they redlined, that is not provide mortgages for homes, uh, in African-American and changing neighborhoods 
I include Hartford because that's where I'm from. I include New York City because it is the center of the universe. And of course, we can't forget New Haven. With concerns couched in class rather than racial terms, many white Jews fled from the cities to the suburbs almost as quickly as white Christians to avoid what they perceived as the deterioration of their schools and neighborhoods as municipal services declined with the white population. Jewish leaders recommended patience and moderation to their black colleagues, but black leaders to whom in King's words later has almost always meant never, they read this as, an, as evidence that Jews could not be relied on as allies. That really wasn't true. Most Jews still believed in a liberalism that focused on individuals rather than groups and their blindness to the benefits that white skin brought had allowed them to believe that they had risen on their own merits. And so black people could do the same if they just kept going. Unable to see the limits of their own liberalism, these white Jews fundamentally misunderstood the frustration and anger of many black activists. And they felt that African-Americans were moving away from the political vision that they had shared. Lesson seven, Position positionality or standpoint matters. Everyone interprets events from their own perspective. Avoiding those sorts of misunderstandings requires intentionally incorporating multiple viewpoints into any political analysis and being wary of potential paternalism or assumptions of a, a quid pro quo except around the edges, this really did not happen. Uh, and I do want to point out here again that the failure uh, to think through different perspectives is nowhere clearer than in the failure of Jewish organizations, almost exclusively white, to bring in Jews of color. It's why uh, black Jewish relations really means black white Jewish relations. It was exactly on these tensions uh, and divisions that collaboration foundered. Diverging political understandings became visible in occasions of direct Black Jewish confrontation and division. For example, in Ocean Hill Brownsville in 1968, which, pre which pitted a primarily Black community against a primarily Jewish teachers union. So many saw this as a Black Jewish confrontation or the affirmative action cases of the 1970s, Baki and Defunis. Black agencies filed briefs on behalf of African-Americans while most Jewish groups filed briefs in opposition. This was the first time that blacks and Jews, black and Jewish organizations had publicly positioned themselves on opposite sides of a civil rights case. For Jews, affirmative action violated the race blind individual individualist liberalism, liberalism that they still believed in. They argue that explicit consideration of group membership was the antithesis of liberalism. But for black people, African affirmative action was crucial to close the gap between the rhetoric of race blindness and the reality of continued discrimination and structural or institutionalized racism. Other examples of black Jewish conflict became nastier. There was Crown Heights in 1991. And there, was pub there were public expressions of black anti-Semitism, most notably in uh, Minister Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam. But it wasn't just political differences or violence that lessened cooperation. The Jewish community had changed. It was now economically largely middle class. And now living primarily in suburbs, Jews and their agencies turned their attention away from the problems of poverty and urban life. Some went further. Neoconservatives argued that liberalism had been transformed into favoritism, social disorganization, bloated budgets, and a nanny state. In other words, if black nationalism challenged liberalism from one side, a Jewish shift towards conservatism and parochialism did so on the other. And the out, outgrowth of this sort of distrust of others also led to what we now call identity politics, which refocused or narrowed what each group defined as its self-interest and its particular concerns. Meanwhile, the gap between black and white incomes and life chances, which had begun to shrink in the 1960s and 70s, widened again. A white backlash 
which swept first Nick, Richard Nixon, then Ronald Reagan, and then Donald Trump into office, in each case reversed recent progress toward educational and residential desegregation and weakened civil rights laws and remedies. And in each case, we have seen a public discourse return to the familiar and chillingly racist rhetoric of us versus them, which cast African-Americans outside the boundaries of American society joined after 9-11 by Muslims, and now at least I would argue the dangerous them also includes immigrants, feminists, queer folks, and Jews. This broader othering means that anti-civil rights efforts have expanded further from racially targeted travel bans to ICE deportations of non-criminal long-term residents with families and the storing of immigrant children in cages. I could go on, but I will start frothing at the mouth. So instead, let's go back to our story. So by the 1980s or so, Blacks and Jews faced very different problems. And liberalism, especially the fractured liberalism that emerged out of the chaos of the 1960s and 70s, seemed either unable to solve them or discredited altogether. And that's where the story usually ends. But I'm not convinced that liberalism died or that most Blacks and Jews weren't and aren't still motivated by liberal and progressive values. Instead, they shifted their attention to different sets of liberal values, uh, liberal issues, I should say. The Jewish community has until recently, at least, largely focused on cultural pluralism, sustaining Jewish identity, and Israel as a safe haven for perse from persecution, which is arguably narrower, but still liberal. For African-Americans, traditional liberal concerns about poverty and discrimination continued to dominate their political agenda, and they felt betray betrayed by Jews' shift away from those issues. So since Blacks and Jews no longer understood themselves as sharing priorities and had largely discarded the rhetoric of universalism in favor of self-assertion, it's not surprising that their partnership withered. But that doesn't mean that either ever abandoned liberalism or the basic values they had shared. The fact is that all along, most white Jews still looked a lot like traditional liberals in their lesser, in their lesser, lesser level of racism, in their continued commitment to traditional civil rights, and their attitude towards social issues, and certainly in their self-perception. Uh, self There's that old Jewish, Jew Jewish joke, Jews earn like Episcopalians and vote like Puerto Ricans. And most Jews still identified as liberals, and they too felt betrayed by the perceived, their perceived rejection by the Black community. And anyway, during those years, I'd argue liberal political cooperation didn't cease. The media just didn't cover it. It wasn't sensational. Black and Jewish groups continued, and continue today, to collaborate on strengthening aid to public education, on anti-poverty programs and access to health care, on hate crimes and, and anti-discrimination legislation on voting rights, on women's rights and gender equality, or at least now to fight uh, to protect what we have from being stripped away altogether. They continue to challenge outbursts of genocidal violence and racial and religious hatred. They both still monitor all cases of bigotry and they continue their tolerance work, which is now called diversity or inclusion. And in the most recent African-American, uh, most recent affirmative action cases, most Jewish groups filed briefs in favor of affirmative action. Now more, Jewish, and now more Jews understand the conflict between race blind theory and existing structures of inequality. In fact, blacks and Jews are still the two groups most likely to vote democratic, 93% and 70% respectively in 2012, just so you know, compared with 39% of whites, 80% and 74% in 2016, 90% and 79% in 2018. They are still the highest two groups, historically higher even than gays and lesbians. Although not surprisingly in 2016, the LGBT community slightly edged out Jews. Both communities re remain invested in the politics that underlay the civil rights coalition. And both groups have reasserted the importance of working together even in Crown Heights. For almost a decade now, well before Trump emerged, as I mentioned in the beginning, there's been a striking new energy in both communities to tackle broad social problems from voting rights to LGBTQ equality, 
from ongoing discrimination to strengthening civic engagement and to do so in coalition. And that's been visible in national forums like par partnerships between the National Urban League and the American Jewish Committee, the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists and the Jewish Labor Committee, the Reform Movement's Religious Action Center and the NAACP's Voter Registration Project, and the new Congressional Black Jewish Caucus. And it's also obvious in local church and synagogue links and action groups across the country, like Black, Boston's Black Jewish Economic Roundtable, Operation Understanding, Great Neck Black Jewish Dialogue, the Thursday Network in Washington, DC, D uh, Toronto's Blacks and Jews in Dialogue, the Atlanta Black Jewish Coalition, and then groups like Carolina Jews for Justice, Baltimore and Washington's Jews United for Justice, New York's Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, all partnering with allies of color around issues of racial and economic justice, and dozens more Black and Jewish local pairings, uh, and even in musical groups like the Afro-Semitic Experience. In fact, many of these local and national links and efforts at making co common cause have begun or, spur or spurred their organizing since 2016. But civil rights work has become broader than exclusively Black Jewish dialogue or even Black Jewish partnerships. Today, the most active coalitions include the intentionally broad and intersectional movement for Black lives, showing up for racial justice, Our Revolution, Move On, Moral Mondays Coalition, the Women's March, Indivisible, and the like. Some Jewish groups have engaged with groups like, like Black Lives Matter, but others have viewed them with fear and suspicion. And we can talk about some of that in the question and answer period if you'd like. But I wanna finish by asking, how do civil rights activists more effectively engage with this new old work? What does the history of Black Jewish political collaboration tell Blacks and Jews and all who would rebuild broad social justice coalitions? I would, re I would summarize and refashion my list of lessons this way. Don't lose sight of structural realities, institutional barriers to equal opportunity, or deny the impact of race and class. When Jews focused on our victimhood and not on our privilege, we failed to recognize that most of our success, much of our success, in all fairness, came from opportunities and benefits accorded only to whites. And so we lost our ability to strategize effectively to bring down those barriers, and we lost the trust of our coalition partners. Educate people about how those real but often invisible barriers operate and work actively to dismantle them in both the broader society and in our own communities. Changing individual hearts and minds is not enough. A race-blind vision of equality is not enough. We have to be honest about what about how these different racial and class positions affect affected relationships and uh, affect relationships of coalition partners. We need to explore rather than ignore differences between and within communities. We have to learn from the ideas of intersectionality to consider things from multiple perspectives and standpoints. We have to look internally, reinforce one's own community's embrace of a shared agenda and challenge its parochialism. It can't always be simply about the small us. We learned that the struggle is most effective when it operates on all levels, national, local, men, women, elite, grassroots, and on many fronts simultaneously lobbying, teaching, legislating, demonstrating, organizing, negotiating. We have to focus on points of commonality among, among allies and recognize that there are points of difference without letting them stop forward motion. We have, we have seen that despite the real tensions between black and Jewish interests throughout the 20th century, Jews stuck with their civil rights commitments and even nationalist black organizations welcomed white allies. We can move even when things are in a mess. Similarly, with points of difference within one's own community. King and Malcolm X disagreed about just about everything, uh, but Malcolm was clear that they shared the end goal. If society rejected him, uh, rejected King, excuse me, it would have to confront him. SNCC uh, mockingly called King the Lord, and young Jewish activists poo-pooed the contributions of liberal Jewish organizations and Southern rabbis pushed against Northern Jewish public expressions of activism. But these internal divisions did not prevent the work they all supported from moving forward. 
Today, there are fierce disagreements within both the Black and the Jewish communities about how to proceed. Hell, I have disagreements with myself, you know, two Jews, three opinions. We have to acknowledge them, we have to confront them, and then find ways to move on despite them. But most importantly, we have to return to that time when we defined our self-interest spaciously and together help build a, mo a movement that transformed American society. When perceived self-interest narrowed and became more parochial, the movement lost its momentum. We've also learned that talk is not enough. As we saw in the civil rights struggle, change came only when talk moved to action. Oops. And to stop pretending uh, that I stop even pretending that I'm a dispassionate historian, I would argue we can't wait. It's not just the terrifying and malicious actions of President Trump and his administration, although I'd be happy to list them, and the increased polarization and hatred now so openly and dangerously expressed. We also still face the challenges we did before of underemployment and poverty, mass incarceration, a frayed safety net, global warning, and the grotesque disparities of wealth that threaten our nation's well being, challenges that have only intensified. And the weakening of civil rights protections, not just under Trump either, have resegregated too much of society. And too, too often, compassion for others, the very idea of civil society, has vanished as a motivation for action or legislation. The struggle against this has already begun, and how we move forward is up to all of us but I do hope that some of these findings point toward some possibilities. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Cheryl, for that fantastic talk that really um, was just so enlightening and, and inspiring too. So thank you. And there are a lot of questions. So I am going to dive right in. I had a lot of my own, but I am going to ventriloquize um, the audience's questions. Um, so there, there are several questions about um, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and about, you know, you, you talked about how, you know, originally there was black solidarity with Israel that, that black uh, groups like the NAACP uh, advocated um, among, you know, black countries to support the creation of Israel, but wondering how that has broken, it seems like it's broken down uh, since the occupation and what have the consequences been and how you see that? Well, as I started to suggest in the talk, really it's the alliances, the international alliances that African-American groups made with anti-colonization movements elsewhere that really raised this whole question about white imperialism, that is European imperialism into colonized non-white areas. And so that raised the question of Israel now seen as a European nation of white people colonizing what was Palestinian land. Mm -hmm. For a while, this was sort of at the fringes of the African American political community because mainstream Black groups were not willing to sacrifice the support of Jewish organizations, and Jews were very prickly about this. Um, but increasingly, it's become expressed as a frustration, especially as the occupation has gone on and as Israel has moved towards more conservative views. And so, uh, what has, what has emerged is that I think anytime there is criticism of Israel, it becomes translated by some people in the, in the Jewish community as anti-Semitic. And here I'm speaking just to the Jewish community. I also think that uh, Jews have a tendency to see our relationship as the most, and our issues as the most important. So for example, when the Black Lives Matter platform, which was 130 odd pages, mentioned Israel in one sentence, many Jewish organizations took the opportunity to say, oh, we're not gonna, we're not gonna get involved with them. I'm, everybody has their own bright line, I'm not criticizing, but it seems to me that it is very convenient that in a moment where we are challenged to rise above our own interests and fight racism, we manage to find the same anti-Semitic or anti-Zionist criticism that's been going on for a long time and say, we're shocked, shocked. We're not gonna take uh, part in this coalition. And so that's where I think you see a division among many people, many groups in the Jewish community. We're not gonna get involved because of the line. We're gonna get, despite, we're gonna get involved despite the line, 
and some cases we're going to get involved because of the line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, there, you know, other people asked specifically about um, the squad and Ilhan Omar. And, um, you know, I know that that has been a big debate in my own family dinner tables, you know, with very concerned, you know, uh, family members wanting to know, but don't I, you know, think that she was anti-Semitic? And, you know, what, what's your response to someone who, who asks you that question? Um, well, I'm probably not a good person to answer this because I don't think it was anti-Semitic. Uh, I think it was, the comments are either ignorant sometimes, um, or not very well thought out and um, also reflect a bias toward Palestinian suffering that Jews hear as anti-Zionism or anti-Israel. Mm. Um, but even if she were anti-Semitic, my argument would be lots of people disagree about lots of things. Mm -hmm. So support her where she does good things and yell at her when she does bad things, just like we do everybody else. I don't agree with anybody 100%. Mm -hmm. There are, as I said, some bright lines. Personally, I can't vote for Donald Trump because he's a racist. I don't care, even if he did wonderful things. That's a bright line for me. Other people have other bright lines, and I understand that. But my answer would be, she's a congresswoman. She's not going to affect foreign policy, but she's going to have a huge impact domestically. And so focus on those positions and see how you like them. And if you can't embrace her, that's fine. Embrace the, the agendas that, she's, that she has that you do agree with. Yeah, I mean, I would say I did think that the thing, some of the things she said did cross the line to, to being anti-Semitic. I mean, she, she used anti-Semitic tropes, but I did think that um, it was, as you said, I think out of ignorance and she did, you know, when, you know, she didn't double down, you know, she, right. she backed off now. I mean, she did under, you know, take it in the criticism. And I think that that's, that's worth something. Um, uh, so to take you up on, on something that you mentioned at the start of your talk, which is that Jews aren't all white. Um, so we're wondering if, if we could, several people have asked about how black Jews fit into the story you're, you're telling. Uh, well, first of all, I know estimates range, but at this point, folks estimate that almost 20% of the Jewish population in, in the United States is non-white. Doesn't mean they're all African-American, but are non-white. And they are either folks who have been Jewish all along, they are products of a Jewish, non-Jewish marriage um, where the children have been raised Jewish, they are converts. There are all sorts of ways in which different communities have joined um, the mm -hmm. Jewish, the white Jewish community. Uh, it is now larger, larger group than it was before, but there have always been black Jews and, and other Jews of color. And my sense is that what's different now is that we realize it. So um, for example, I was invited to give a talk at two different synagogues, one in DC and one in New York, who spent the year, this is before COVID, before Black Lives Matter stuff, spent the year focusing on how to be more inclusive in the Jewish community of Jews of color. So I think now it is an agenda to say, oh, look, there are multiple person, people here and we can't always have this white um, view. And what I suggest in the beginning, at least, I really do believe, which is that if I'm correct, that part of the problem facing the Black Jewish coalition is the Jews didn't face their racism or their white privilege, they could have done so had they only recognized and talked to the Black Jews in their midst. And so by ignoring the Black Jewish community, white Jews missed out on a whole set of opportunities to do things better. Very interesting. Okay, so we have a question from an anonymous attendee. It's an interesting question about how Jewish organizations, as I understand this question, Jewish organizations um, direct so much um, uh, charitable uh, efforts towards the Black community, um, job training, childcare, healthcare, you know, and, and also advocacy efforts. You know, the, there are so many, you know, Jews who, who think, including, you know, what we're doing here. Uh, so the question is, um, 
does that help uh, Black Jewish relations? Does that help uh, Black people want, liking Jews, or does it just seem paternalistic? Some of both, maybe. Um, I, you know, it's a little bit like Donald Trump to suburban women, right? Can't you just like me? Um, yes, there is a certain level of paternalism that has always operated between mm -hmm. Blacks and Jews, that the Jewish group sort of, we know what we're doing here, let us help you. I think currently though, I think it is a different story. Um, again, when I am contacted by different groups, I was asked by the Jewish, the American Jewish archives to speak on black Jewish relations. What does an archive have to do with black Jewish relations? The, my sense is that the Jewish community is seriously thinking about white privilege and how they as white people have a certain responsibility to educate themselves about racist structures. And all of the activism that I've seen that engages black groups particularly on the left, always talk about this. They always discuss the issues of race, the issues of, um, of black Jews or Jewish black people, right? So they are absolutely engaged in as honest a relationship and dialogue as they possibly can be. Mm -hmm. So yes, of course, a richer organization is gonna seem paternalistic to a, to a, poorer, a poorer group or whatever. Um, but I do actually think that most Jews that I know of, at least, um, are serious about rethinking their relationship with the Black community and rethinking the importance of the, that work for themselves, right? Because it's in Jewish and white self-interest to have a more equitable society. Terrific. Okay, last question, because we're almost out of time, and it's a great one. Uh, could you, if you could recommend three books uh, to white Jews who want to better understand the dynamics in play, which three books would you recommend? Oh, gosh. Of course, yours. And let oh, of course, of course. I, I will recommend yours again. So for everybody, Troubling the Waters, Black Jewish Relations in the American Century, uh, published by Princeton University Press. Um. It's a, it's a great question, and I'm going to punt by saying um, that I think what Jews have to do now is think about, what white Jews have to do now, is think about their role as white people. And so the same kind of list that people have been putting up in general, how to be an anti-racist, um, white fragility, whatever, those sorts of books force white people to confront our own relationship with whiteness and the ways in which these discriminatory barriers operate without us, as everybody could wake up non-racist tomorrow and it wouldn't change anything or it wouldn't change a lot, right? Because these structures are in place. And so I think uh, just as I think every white person has to come to grips with the way that they have benefited from these invisible lines and that black people have been hurt by those invisible uh, barriers, so too do Jews. We now have an added burden in a way. We're not just white, we are also Jewish. And so what is the Jewish obligation to help tikkun olam, to help repair the world and to do so without patronizing anybody, to do so without being oblivious to things. And so I do think that there's a second level of education and thought that has to go into the Jewish position. But I really think that the key at this point is for white Jews to confront their whiteness. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I agree, and I, I think that there's um, a really interesting, um, uh, the, the book, the recent book, Cast, by Isabel Wilkerson, I think, which is one of the more interesting books that I've read recently. And it's especially interesting, I think, um, because she relates um, uh, race prejudice in America to Nazi Germany and to the, to the, I mean, that's one, that and the Indian caste system are her two examples. And so it's fascinating to see an African-American writer really thinking hard about the lessons of anti-Semitism and what they have to, um, to teach us. So, uh, on that note, anyway, so I, that is a little shout out for that, for that book too. So anyway, thank you so much. This was such a rich and great um, talk. And I really think, um, I, I really could not have asked for a better lecture to really enlighten our community on these issues. So thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. It was truly a pleasure.